Well, welcome back. Our next chapter is photosynthesis, which is very similar to cell respiration. We're still kind of in our energy mode, thinking about energy conversions. So photosynthesis, much like cell respiration, is all about energy conversions. But in particular, we're taking solar energy, that energy contained in light coming from the sun, and plants are taking that energy and converting it into a chemical energy. So they're converting that energy into the energy that is holding macromolecules together, those carbon to carbon chemical bonds. And that's a sp stable form of energy, then cells can save that up. They can use it when they need to, and they have it available to them. Now, obviously, this is happening in autotrophs. Autotrophs, remember, just means organisms that can make their own food. They're the cell feeders. And when we think of autotrophs, we do think of plants right away, but realize there are mo many photosynthetic bacteria, many protists are photosynthetic as well. And so plants are not the only autotrophs uh, out there in the natural world. And if we think of a marine environment, certainly much of our uh, world is covered by oceans, we think of a lot of photosynthetic bacteria. And so here we see lots of bacteria cells all connected together in chains. Certainly protists like seaweed or kelp here are photosynthetic, generating their own food through photosynthesis. And in our terrestrial environment, we do certainly think of plants, whether it's uh, crops generating their own food or whether it's more native uh, landscape, plants generating their own sugars and food products. Much like Mitochondria are associated with cell respiration, our organelle are a power or abusable energy. In plants and protists, chloroplasts are the organelle where photosynthesis occurs. And again, this is a complex metabolic pathway, lots of different chemical reactions all contained within these chloroplasts. The chloroplasts are found in the leaves that make up the cells, excuse me, that make up the leaves. Each cell has hundreds of chloroplasts in it. These chloroplasts are small and green. If we take a look at the picture here and zoom in gradually closer, Leaves actually have a clear surface. They're not green as they kind of appear to the naked eye, but instead the leaf surface is clear, but underneath that clear surface are cells with hundreds of these little tiny green dots, these microscopic chloroplasts, and the chloroplasts are again where photosynthesis is going to occur. And the main chemical here is chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is a green pigment. Chlorophyll is important because it's the pigment that is actually going to absorb that solar energy. So it's going to take the energy from the sun and absorb it, and then it's going to convert that solar energy into chemical energy. And so this is by far the most important chemical in our process of photosynthesis is that pigment chlorophyll. Now chlorophyll happens to be green in color, and so it certainly is chlorophyll that makes plants and leaves look green. But realize that's kind of a side effect. The function of chlorophyll is to absorb energy and to convert energy. It's not to make the plants look green. Again, that's just kind of a side effect that results in the greenery that we see in our natural world. If we think big picture first here, in terms of photosynthesis, photosynthesis is endergonic, which means it requires energy to be added to it. And obviously that energy is going to come from the sun. We have small, low energy reactants. The products of photosynthesis, in, by comparison, are larger, more complex, and they're high energy. They're going to contain a lot of potential energy. That energy in those products is going to come from solar energy. We're going to try to harness it into those products and store up that energy again so that it's available for the plant when it needs it. And so if we look at our summary reaction of our pathway, carbon dioxide and water are two low energy reactants. The whole series of reactions is driven by light energy. Those carbon dioxides are going to be bound together to make glucose, our sugar, which is going to be our energy containing chemical, and then oxygen gas given as a waste or a byproduct from the process of photosynthesis. And since light is so important to this process, I just want to take a couple minutes and talk a little bit about light and energy. Light that comes from the sun is made up of little bundles called photons. And a photon is a particle of light that contains energy. And these photons are little bundles of solar energy. Now, every photon is not created equally. There are different photons that have different amounts of energy in them. And these photons, as they travel from the sun to the Earth, are traveling in a wavelength pattern. So they don't travel like a beam or a straight line, but more like a wave going up and down. And depending on how much energy is in a photon, that's going to determine its wavelength. High energy photons tend to travel in very short, quick wavelengths. Low energy photons tend to travel in long, slow wavelengths. And wavelength is not only going to measure energy, but it's also going to determine the color of light. And so if we look at a spectrum here, there's lots of particles of energy coming from the sun from really high energy things like gamma rays to really low energy particles like radio waves. And visible light is kind of right in the middle of that range. And within light, we know that white light is made up of all colors, from purples and the blues and greens, yellows, oranges, and reds. 
and the high energy visible light are near the end of the spectrum there toward the purple and the blues. Those are the short wavelength, the high energy particles. The low energy light are the reds and the oranges, kind of long, slow wavelengths. And plants are very efficient at using all these different wavelengths, except for green. Green is reflected, and that's why uh, plants are not particularly good at absorbing green light. The other issue I want to mention, because it pertains directly to animals and us as humans as an animal in particular, is oxygen is a byproduct or a waste product for the plants in terms of photosynthesis. And while many gases in our atmosphere come from the Earth naturally, things like methane and nitrogen, the only source of oxygen or O2 gas in the atmosphere is through photosynthesis. And it makes up almost 20% of the air that we breathe in and out. And that's all come through photosynthesis. And so if we look at a plant like this Elodea, a typical kind of aquarium plant, we can see the gas oxygen being released there as a waste product underwater. And that oxygen obviously very fundamental to organisms because we need that for cell respiration to get energy into usable forms of our own. And there are many similarities between photosynthesis and cell respiration. Many of the chemical processes in the pathway are really similar be uh, between the two, except they're in reverse. In cell respiration, we're breaking down chemicals to release energy. In photosynthesis plants are building chemicals to store up energy. And so in a lot of ways, cell respiration is the reverse process of photosynthesis. Cell respiration is exergonic. It's breaking down chemicals to release energy. But again, many of the chemical pathways are very similar. In photosynthesis, we're going to see coenzymes that contain high energy. We're going to see these electrons being passed down electron transport chains and all these redox reactions as well. So again, a lot of similarities except for the energy issue. Cell respiration releases energy. Photosynthesis stores up energy. And in fact, if we compare the two here, here's our summary reaction that we just listed for photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide and water, low energy. We're going to add light to it and through our metabolic pathway generate sugar and oxygen as our waste product. And if you remember our cell respiration reaction, in cell respiration we take high energy chemicals like glucose. We require oxygen. We're aerobic. And through our pathway we're going to break that sugar and oxygen into carbon dioxide and water and we're going to release that energy in ATP form to make it usable. Well, obviously, if we look at these two things, we see they're very intimately tied together. The products of photosynthesis are the reactants of cell respiration and vice versa. The products of cell respiration are the reactants in photosynthesis. And so certainly animals and plants are recycling these basic nutrients and just shifting around the energy and comparing photosynthesis to respiration. If we take a look at our photosynthetic pathway, we can break the metabolic pathway of photosynthesis into two distinct chemical stages. The first stage of reactions are the reactions that require solar energy, and those are referred to as the light-dependent reactions because they depend on light as their energy source to make these things happen. So they require that sunlight. They require those photons to happen. And in this set of reactions, plants inside those chloroplasts are going to convert that solar energy into short-term chemical energy. And so this is a really huge step in converting solar energy into a more stable form of chemical energy. And in addition, this is also where oxygen is produced. Independent reactions are the second stage or the second group of reactions. And they're called the light independent reactions because this set of reactions doesn't really require light. Instead, what happens here is the sugar is going to be built, our, our glucose molecule, using carbon dioxide from the air. And to do this, it requires energy. And the energy that drives these light independent reactions is the short-term energy coming from the light dependent reactions. And so in the light dependent reactions, solar energy is going to be converted into short-term chemical energy. In the light independent reactions, that short-term energy is going to be used to form a more stable long-term form of chemical energy, a sugar. And certainly chlorophyll is a main ingredient in this process of photosynthesis because chlorophyll is absorbing the light energy. It is making that crucial step of going from solar to chemical energy. And again, chlorophyll very good at absorbing light of most wavelengths in the visible light spectrum. The one color that chlorophyll does not absorb is green light. And green light is reflected or bounces off the chlorophyll, and that's why our eyes pick up green light. And so color is one of those odd sort of things because it's green meaning it, the green light bounces off and all the other colors are absorbed. So the blues and the yellows and the oranges are all absorbed into the chlorophyll. And so they're very efficient at using those different colors for energy sources, but the green light is going to bounce off. It's reflected, and that's how what our eyes pick up and give us that green color when we look at plants. So if we take a look at our light-dependent reactions first, 
our first stage is that light is going to hit chlorophyll. Though that energy in that photon is going to be absorbed by the chlorophyll. What happens then is electrons are going to be absorbing that energy. And so that chlorophyll passes that light energy onto an electron, which causes that electron to enter what's sometimes referred to as an excited state, meaning it's high energy. It's not a very stable electron at this energy state. Once this energy has been transferred to this electron, then the electron is going to pass down an electron transport chain, very, very similar to what we saw with cell respiration. A whole series of redox reactions, electrons pass from one chemical to another. As that electron moves down that chain, it's losing a little bit of its energy. Remember, think of our slinky going down the stairs example. And that energy that that electron loses as it passes down the chain is going to be harnessed by the cell and converted into some short-term energy in terms of a chemical form that the cell can save up. And chlorophyll doesn't do this whole process of the light-dependent reactions on its own. Instead, chlorophyll is associated with a couple of groups of chemicals called photosystems. And a photosystem is a chlorophyll pigment plus all the associated chemicals in the electron transport chain. So all the other proteins in the metabolic pathway plus chlorophyll makes up a photosystem. And it turns out in chloroplasts there are two different photosystems. And here we can see uh, a picture of an example of a photosystem. The chlorophyll represents the green, and then all these other dots within that protein represent members of the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain in these photosystems are a little bit different between the photosystem 1 and the photosystem 2, these two different photosystems in plants. But they're relatively similar to that, what we saw in cell respiration. And what happens during these light reactions then is light energy is absorbed by chlorophyll. That's passed on to an electron. And then electrons are going to be passed down this electron transport chain, pumping the pumps, pumping H pluses across the membrane, just like we saw with cell respiration. That's photosystem 2. Once the electron is out of energy at the end of that photosystem, it gets passed on to another chlorophyll. It gets excited by light again, so it joins that excited state by gaining energy from light, and it passes down photosystem 1, our second electron transport, which doesn't generate ATP. Instead, it generates a chemical called NADPH, which is a coenzyme very similar to those that we saw in cell respiration. So here we can see that all put together. Photosystem 2 absorbs light. It passes down a chain that's working these pumps to pump H pluses across the membrane. Eventually, when those H pluses rush back through that ATP synthase, remember that's our turbine, our uh, hole in the dam, if you will, it's going to generate ATP. And so ATP is generated from photosystem 2. Eventually, that electron gets passed to the next chlorophyll. When it gets excited by light, it gets passed down a different electron transport chain in photosystem 1, and that energy gets stored up in that coenzyme, that NADPH. And your book has a nice example. Uh, it makes me think of the old kids game Mousetrap. Uh, but basically, that photon is used to excite that electron. You see the guy hitting the hammer, adding energy to that electron. That electron then passes through the turbines, generating ATP as it goes through that electron transport chain. The next guy is going to hit it again, representing more energy from a photon. And that energy then is going to end up being stored in, AD in ADPH, another high energy coenzyme. If we take a look at a little picture here then, Chlorophyll is the main chemical here driving these light reactions along with these photosystems. The electrons that pass through these photosystems come from water. And so water is a main ingredient. We know solar energy is also a main ingredient. As the chloroplasts then generate energy from solar energy and passing it on to those electrons, some of that energy from those photons are going to get passed on to ATPs. Some are going to be generating NADPHs, and those two chemicals represent our short-term energy products of photosynthesis from these light-dependent reactions. This is also where the oxygen comes from. It started out as that oxygen in water. It's going to be turned into oxygen gas. So that's the main waste product of the light-dependent reactions. The next series of reactions, then, in photosynthesis are the light-independent reactions. And the major part of this is a cyclical pattern of reactions referred to sometimes as the Calvin cycle or the C3 cycle. And it's referred to as a cycle because many of the chemicals are going to be recycled or reused over and over. And the energy for the light independent reactions is going to come from that short-term energy, the ATP and the NADPHs that were just derived in the light reactions. And in this set of reactions, carbon dioxide from the air are going to be cooked together to form three carbon products. And these three carbon chemicals is called, is called G3P. And here we can see an overview of this. And the G3P is a stable 
form of energy that the cell then can utilize for many different functions. So the major product of these light independent reactions is this G3P, which stands for glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. This glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is a small chemical, only three carbons long, and it's a very versatile chemical. It's a building block that plant cells can convert into lots of different chemicals. By far, most of the time, plants will take two of these three carbon G3Ps and they'll hook them together to form a glucose. Probably 90% or better of the G3Ps are going to be turned into sugar. But they can also be used to make fats within the plant cell. They can make amino acids, remember our building blocks to proteins, or they can be converted into sugars other than glucose as well. And so plants generate a tremendous amount of this G3P. Most is going to be converted to sugar. Others might be used as building blocks for other macromolecules. So if we put both of our sets of reactions together, we see our light dependent reactions on the left, again, generating ATP and NADPH, so short-term energy chemicals. On the right now, we see our Calvin cycle. It's going to utilize that energy to fix carbon, which means it's taking carbon out of the air and hooking them together. Our main product is going to be that three carbon G3P. Those G3Ps then oftentimes are going to be generated or converted into sugars, which then the cell can utilize. And just like animal cells, plant cells have mitochondria, and they undergo cell respiration. And so those sugars that are made in photosynthesis are going to be stored up. And then when a plant needs energy, it's going to take that glucose and break it down through cell respiration to convert that energy into a usable form, into ATPs. So sometimes I think we have the mindset animals have mitochondria and plants have chloroplasts. But remember, plants have mitochondria and chloroplasts, and they undergo both of these energy uh, metabolism, both photosynthesis and cell respiration. So if we summarize photosynthesis, again, it is a complex pathway. It's all about converting energy, in particular solar, into chemical energy. And it is an endergonic set of reactions, so we're storing up chemical energy. That energy is going to come from photons of light. We know there's lots of different wavelengths traveling at different speeds with different amounts of energy. Oxygen also is a byproduct of photosynthesis and that we're going to see many chemical similarities between our two metabolic energy pathways here. With the light-dependent reactions, it requires chlorophyll to absorb that energy. Chlorophyll is arranged in different photosystems with other members of the electron transport system. And again, it's going to convert solar energy into that short-term chemical energy. Then our light-independent reactions, the Calvin cycle, is going to take that short-term chemical energy and fix carbon from the air and generate these three carbon G3Ps which in turn are usually going to be converted into sugars. So if we take a look at a little animation here uh, and a close-up, and so we're going to zoom in to a plant, and to, particularly into a leaf and eventually a cell, and as we get closer what we'll see is cells have stomata, which are all these little openings or holes that allow gases to pass in. Carbon dioxide, as we see, is the main ingredient to photosynthesis. Oxygen is the waste product. And so here we're coming into a cell. Here's our chloroplast, our main organelle for photosynthesis. And certainly lots of carbon dioxide are needed for photosynthesis to take place. All these green stacks represent the stacks of chlorophyll and these different photosystems. So if we take a look at the light reactions, in our light chemical reactions, water is going to provide us with the electrons to travel through all these electron transport chains. So as we zoom in, here we can see the electron transport chains. We see the, the photons of light being absorbed by our two photosystems, our two green chunks of chlorophyll. That light energy is going to be absorbed by the chlorophyll. Electrons from water are going to be excited by that energy. That energy is passed on to those electrons, and then they're going to travel down electron transport chains in these light-dependent reactions. In particular, if we take a close-up look here at what's going on in photosystem 2, that electron from water is excited, it's going to be passed down a whole series of the electron transport chain through these redox reactions. As the electron gets passed on, that electron is going to work the transport proteins pumping H pluses across the membrane. And so we can see these H pluses are being pumped into the membrane. That electron then is passed on to a chlorophyll in photosystem 2. When it gets struck by light energy that excites it, it goes through that second photosystem. In turn, that electron is going to end up in that NADH, and so that's where our energy is coming from. Those H pluses that are pumped through from our second photosystem then will rush through our turbines, creating ATP. And so our main products here from our light-dependent reactions are ATP and NADPH, with our main waste product being oxygen. 
Now in our light independent reactions or the Calvin cycle, carbon dioxide is going to be fixed in the air and converted into sugars eventually. And so here we see our carbon dioxide. It's added to existing carbon structures, which then are going to be modified and eventually converted into these G3P molecules, again using the energy from NADPH, the little red molecule bouncing around, and ATP energy then is used to connect these G3 molecules together to eventually form glucose as our main product from plants or sugar. And here we see the glucose is being formed. If plants have lots of extra energy, they may even hook these glucoses together to form something like starch. The main waste product then is oxygen. Now plants do require oxygen and their mitochondria are utilizing oxygen and we see a mitochondria near the bottom here to generate usable energy in ATP. But plants produce more oxygen than they need and so while they use a little bit of oxygen, most of the oxygen that they produce through photosynthesis is going to be released back through those stomata back into the air where we as animals can take advantage of that and breathe that oxygen in for our own process of cell respiration.